<laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Uh, what the flick? Uh, Matt, Alonzo, Ben, Patrick, Fabian, Better Call Saul. Nice hey, to man. see you. Thanks Thank for you for me. coming. Um, so already we're 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 two episodes into season four, mm-hmm. and somehow this show, which we did we did reviews of the first season, yes. and we liked it, yes, a lot. But somehow it just adds these little layers each season, and somehow gets marginally better. And I would say that's already true. Two episodes in. Wow, thank you very much. You know, I, I will tip my hat immediately to uh, the writing staff and uh, the genius of uh, Peter Gould and, and Vince Gilligan. You know, they create such a detailed world, and I think we got fans who appreciate that detailed. I mean, uh, both visually and, uh, and orally. So when season four started rolling around, you know, we had a little bit of a delay until we, we got it out, which, which, you know, made people a little more excited about it. But that first season, we got to see the premiere down at Comic-Con this year, and I was so pleased to, like, uh, listen to the audience when they were breathing, when they weren't breathing. And uh, that makes you really excited to be a performer, to, to, like, witness that and to see people, like, excited about it. Vince Gilligan's role is significant, uh, moderate in the day-to-day running of the show? Or? You know what? And he said this very much. Yeah. He has taken his hands off the reins. It's, it's Peter Gould's show at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, Vince has other obligations. He's been going down. So as he said, he's a fan at this point. So he drops in uh, every now and then. I'm, I'm sure there's no complete leaving in some respect. I don't know how you, you do that. But uh, but really, Peter runs runs the the right writer's room, and he's our executive producer at this point. The, the show is so interestingly fragmented among all these sort of different worlds that don't necessarily interact. What are all are, these gangsters doing exactly, in the show? Are, are there cast members that you only see at the rap party? Uh, you know, I, a couple, couple things. One, I remember saying to Jonathan Banks after uh, the second season, I was like, you know, Jonathan, I, I, I really want to have a scene with you. I mean, that would be really fun. And he goes, Patrick. You don't want to scene with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about that, and I thought, maybe I don't. And, right? and, you know, and also yeah. another Jonathan Beggs, he comes into HHM one day. Uh, his, his scene was up next. So he came to location. We're shooting on location in Albuquerque, and he comes to my beautiful HHM offices, and he comes, he looks around, and he goes, are you kidding me? <laughs> you get to work in here? <laughs> Why are you sticking me out in the desert in the cold? And uh, you know, I went to visit them, and I'm like, "What's all this dirt doing here?" So I, you know, I'm always surprised, like all the viewers, every time I watch it's, it, that we've gone from the lawyer show to this this gangster well, show. That's one of the things I was I've been thinking about, especially in this most recent episode. And I don't want I'm not going to ask you to give anything away, but there's certain characters we know are going to make it through the end of the show because mm-hmm. we know right. that they show up in Better Call Saul, right? Like we know Breaking Bad. Bad yeah. Sorry, Better Call. Right. We're going to see. We're going to see Jimmy. We're going to see Mike. Mike. We're going to see Gus. But like Michael, like Nacho, I'm not so sure about. Mm. And you know, you mean your Nacho show, right? <laughs> right. But nice, then it starts right. to think like if That's why we bad things it. happen to the people that are associated <laughs> with Jimmy, like. How does that play out for Kim? Does that play out for? Well, what about? I mean, that's the, to me, that's the the biggest issue here, sure. and, and my uh, uh, you know uh, solidly solely on screen love affair with Ray Seahorn is what. <laughs> but, but like me too. What? Um, well, yours is actually on screen. Mine is me <laughs> watching a screen. Um, but um, what happens to Kim? I mean, that is the that is the biggest question of Better Call Saul. When sure. You know, I mean, do I? Pray in some way, in some weird way, that she moved away for six years, and then we're going to get him in Minneapolis at the, uh, at, the at the Cinnabon <laughs> when we get some resolution to that. And there she is at home, sort you know, of that, just that, having wrapped up a big case at Minneapolis <laughs> District Court. You that know? could be. Right, that right. could be. I mean, it, she gets that a lot too, and of course, that's a, that's a weird thing to get, right? As an actress, and um, here's what I know: is that um, part of the deliciousness of Better Call Saul is that since we have this inevitability that there's that weird hope that somehow she's gonna turn him and keep him to be Jimmy McGill and they are gonna go off somewhere else. But we know that doesn't happen. So watching the slow motion car wreck is sort of the thing that's like, ah. So then you start imagining like, is she gonna be killed? Is she just gonna uh, drift away? Which is also equally aching and awful and empty. Or does she make some sort of bold decision like, I am done with these people, and I got a job in Philadelphia, and I'm going to go have a real life, which is what sort of theoretically or, you would like well, for that. Well, I think we would like maybe her and Hamlin discover something, and they go to the Caribbean, and they open a pro bono law firm. And they, <laughs> well, this is on Discovery coming in this 2020. <laughs> this sounds like a USA show. So I don't know that I'm down. Thought, yeah. <laughs> now, were, were you uh, were you a Breaking Bad watcher? Does this was this 
universe important to you? Or uh, I'm going to throw my wife under the bus right now. No, uh, we did not watch Breaking Bad, and it's because my wife was pregnant eight months with our uh, first child when we watched the pilot of Breaking Bad. And after she, she's rubbing the miracle of life and we see the pilot, she turns to me and she goes, no. yeah, I'm not on board with yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> so we missed that first season and second season. We had a second kid. Now I've got Clifford the Big Red Dog down. And I've also got Super Y right under my belt. But we managed to miss it. I mean, I, I missed it. Even though it was on the billboards, now, or do you I got the job, and then I yeah. watched all of it. We right. binged oh. it, so I, that was the first thing I ever binged, and that's when all of a sudden, uh, I mean, I think uh, I'm lucky that I went to the audition actually not knowing, mm. because after I saw it, then I got nervous. I was like, right. "Wow, I booked this job!" So I was <laughs> right, I was but also, but it's good. I mean, right? You, you know, uh, uh, Howard doesn't know it. No, you know, right? He doesn't know anything that's going to happen, um, no, no, or I, who these people are. You know, he's living it. So I took, I get two questions. One, yeah. just an observation I made. So there's never been an episode of Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul set entirely in New Mexico where it's been hot, near as I can tell. Every time, it's the whole show is set during. Sweatshirt season. Uh, right? no, oh, uh, November in New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like my image of New Mexico is always like, you know, there's some 97 degree days. Sure, there's brutal. Because you brutto. said, you because you mentioned you went at Jonathan Banks, the desert, she's in the cold in the desert. Oh, he, start, he, he started, like, I think one season we were in there and the first day it was like, it was like 109 degrees. Yeah. And Jonathan Banks is standing outside, and he's wearing his jacket. He's got right, his mic jacket right, on, right. and he's just dripping sweat. And he's like, "I am not happy." So, you know, <laughs> like, does Howard own a single seersucker suit? Come on. No, he does not. He does not. Look, those suits are great. Jennifer Bryan is our wardrobe designer, and it's like, uh, as an actor. Man, she does like eighty percent of my work. I put on that <laughs> suit, and I just feel like, uh, you know. Like I am in the show, I, I'm richer than everybody else, and I walk into every scene, and I feel like I'm more powerful and better dressed, and that really helps lend itself to my characterization. Yeah, those suits are so iconic that the scene where Jimmy buys one, <sighs> you know, that whole that episode where he's basically being you, like yeah. that, you just put the suit on, and we, we immediately clicks. Well, it was so much fun to do that too, as well. That, that day, that was the first season. You know, we're sitting there side by side, as like you know, frick and frack, and um, and really, I think we can be honest about this. You know, he. He really doesn't wear the suit as well as I do. <laughs> right, sure. yeah. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> yeah. You just don't. Uh, <laughs> no, but when you get this, when you get the montage of him buying his own suit. Oh right. God! Oh, and the right. excitement. Those the are so good. The, with the Scorpio, the that. candy yeah. colored suits. Yeah. yeah. But there were there were a couple scenes in this last episode. There's there were you know, set up by the first episode where your sort of manipulation sort of uh, I, I, I to some extent I missed it until Kim exposed it in that in, intensely wonderful scene that you so two good. had at the end. I mean, it was just such a great, such a great scene. And you're, but you know, as always, you know, in a sense, I know she's amazing in it, but you have the tough part of like reacting Listen. and still not being a total villain. You just keep like, okay, okay, wait, wait, can we, can we recycle this? Can we, I, don't know, I, I just thought it was great. It well, was thank great. you very much. Um, but also early on that scene. So, so I thought that was powerful. And then, but I then reinterpreted your Episode one monologue. Your episode one monologue. Where oh, I the, think it's so funny you guys are doing revisionist history because uh, I, I do not see it like that whatsoever. Really? No, I'm, I'm, his, his points are well made. He does go to relieve. In episode one, he goes to relieve Jimmy of his guilt. Howard is still taking care of Jimmy even after Chuck is dead. He goes there to say, it's me because I know it, you're thinking no, it's I, you. See, I think that- I think, I'm on, I know I'm on, but I'll look right, No, no, you're on Kim's, I get I it, you're on Kim's you're, side. Whatever. You made that very clear. No, 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 that's fine. One of the things I love is that- <laughs> I like that you're being, you're, the, 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 that Howard is being Jimmy's Sin eater, though you know. Well, it is. Yeah, yeah. it is a little bit. But but I see you, what you point out. Somebody has mentioned as well. They go, oh, they punched holes in Howard's argument, and and I think she's letting go of three years of of anxiety and frustration that the audience has been freighted yes. with as well. And so I think all of a sudden, like I'm back in bad guy land, and and I do not think that's really the case. And I think. I think we'll find out more as the season continues. <laughs> Patrick, thank you very much. Patrick Fabian, Thanks, Better Call Saul, uh, Mondays on uh, AMC. Yes. And thank and you for the uh, TCM, the shout out, the writers. That Absolutely. And the recaps are stuff. returning starting next Wednesday. That's right. All right.